Yeah. Buttons pushed right. right. All right. All the electrons are moving in the right way. Good morning. My name is Brad. I'm the teaching elder here at the Way. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus our Savior. If you have your copy of God's Word, we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 2. So we continue our study through the book of Ephesians entitled Know God and Live Like It. What a great song that was. Wow. That's my new favorite song. Wasn't that good? You guys can just follow me around all day singing that song. I may never sing it again. All right, Ephesians chapter 2. We're talking about life to death. We're talking about life and death and life to death, that Christianity is a unique religion and that it is the only religion that involves a transformation from a position of life to a position of death. It's not a religion of improvement or making us better. It's a religion literally of transformation in that we receive that transformation. We are transformed. And we're talking for last Sunday, this Sunday, and next Sunday, uh, the first 10, 10 verses of chapter 2 talking about this transformation. And so I invite you to join me as I begin reading in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. If you need a copy of the Word, we have some in the back. Raise your hand. Mr. Neal will chunk one across the sanctuary at you. That's like Sykeston. What's the place called? Lambert. Lambert's. Who's been to Lambert's? They chunk rolls at you. Lambert's. Yes. We'll chunk the bread of life at you. Look. Yeah, she's open. Hit her. Come on. This is your chance, Mr. Neal. <laughs> That's possibly the greatest thing I've seen. All right. That's enough banter. Back to serious business. All right. I'm going to start reading in verse 1 of Ephesians chapter 2. The Word of God says this. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, I pray that even now your spirit is filling up our hearts to receive what you would have us receive. Uh, Lord, I pray that my words would be your words. Uh, if there's anything of these words that is of me, that it would be like chaff in the wind would blow away, that my words would fall upon deaf ears, and all that the people would hear would be your words as we worship you with the preaching of your word that we love and we cherish. And it's in your holy name that we pray. Amen. So again, Paul is writing to discouraged Christians in the city of Ephesus. And we noticed last week that he hadn't told them anything about themselves. He hadn't, he hadn't told these discouraged Christians anything that, uh, you know, what's our temptation when somebody's discouraged to tell them how wonderful they are, how strong they are. You can do it. You know, give them a, a pep talk. He doesn't do any of that. He tells them all about the Lord in chapter 1. He prays for them. And the first thing he tells them about themselves is chapter 2, verse 1 where he tells them that they are dead in their trespasses and sins in which they once walked. That doesn't seem to be very encouraging to somebody who might be suffering. And these Ephesian Christians were certainly suffering. They were in a difficult situation. They lived in a godless and pagan city. They were surrounded by spiritual darkness all over the place. But here Paul proceeds to tell them about this transformation that has been done in them. He's reminding them of their transformation from death to life. And we explored in detail the, the death aspect. We've got to know where we start the journey. And we explored that in detail last week. He tells them that they're dead in their trespasses and sins. And the word there for dead is not some kind of nuanced word. It literally means 
dead, that in our trespasses and sins from conception, we are born spiritually dead. And one day we will physically die and our physical death will reveal our spiritual death. And in our physical death or in our spiritual death, we are unable to respond. We have a moral inability to respond to the things of God. He tells us this very clearly. We're dead in our trespasses and sins. And we sin in so many different ways. And scripture reveals to us all the different ways that we sin. We commit sins of presumption where we know what the word of God says, but we presume his forgiveness. We commit sins of ignorance. Did you know that a sin of ignorance is still a sin? And that's why we pray to God to reveal to us the things in our heart that are sinful to him. We can commit sins of commission, sins of omission. The sin of silence. When's the last time you committed the sin of silence where God was telling you, where you knew you ought to open your mouth and say something, yet we keep our mouths closed with the gospel message, keeping it to ourselves. We sin in so many different ways. He tells us that we were dead in our trespasses and sins, but God, but God. We were following after the prince of the power of the air, the course of this world. Our entire world system is arranged against God. But in our spiritual deadness, what do we do but follow after the world system? We follow after the prince of the power of the air. That's Satan himself. Scripture tells us you're either a child of God or you're a child or a son of Satan. You're either following God or you are following Satan. Literally, it draws that clear of a line. There's no one or the other. You can't do a little bit of both. He says we all once lived. This is the universality of our spiritual deadness. But God. But God. He says we followed the passions of the flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. What do most or what do unregenerate people seek after? But to satisfy their, their base lust, their base lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride in one's lifestyle. And we unfortunately see churches offering to unregenerate people that which their flesh already desires and calling it the church. And we are by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. This is the bleakness of the human condition. This is the darkness and despair of the human condition. But God, my two favorite words in all of Scripture. I've been dying to preach these two words uh, for quite some time. I'd like to talk to you first about the primacy of God from verse 4. These two words, but God, we see here a pivot. We see a transition. We see a change in direction. We're children of wrath going one direction, doomed and destined for eternal suffering in a place called hell. But God. It's all about God. It's all about Jesus. Listen, we want it to be about us. And how do I know that you want it to be about you? Because I want it to be about me. Nobody wants it to be more about themselves than me. I promise you this. But who is the active agent here? But God. Who, is, who has primacy from first to last, from beginning to end? In all of Scripture, it is the story of God and His redemptive work. Very first pages of Scripture, Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. Even John chapter 1, verse 1 tells us that in the beginning was the Word. In the, in the Greek there, it tells us that in the beginning, Jesus already existed in the beginning. We spent exactly two years preaching through the book of Genesis, and we talked quite in detail about the progression of covenants in the Old Testament that reveal to us increasingly the covenant of redemption or the, the new covenant. And I'd like to read to you some excerpts from some of these covenants. Listen to the Abrahamic covenant. God says to Abraham, I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. I will bless all the families of the earth through you. Who is the active agent here? God, he says, I will. He didn't ask Abraham his permission. He didn't ask Abraham if he would like to be a great nation. He didn't ask Abraham if he would like to be blessed, if he would like to be the one from whom, whose line Jesus would come. He didn't ask him that in any way. 
We see even in the Mosaic Covenant, some people consider the Mosaic Covenant a conditional covenant that God would do, he would bless Israel if Israel was obedient. And in some ways, that's a way to look at it. But listen to the language of Deuteronomy chapter 7. He says to them, he says, you are a holy people. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the earth. Not because you're more numbered than any other people, but because he set his love upon you. Again, God chose Israel. He didn't ask them if they would like to be chosen. He didn't say, hey, Israel, would you like to be my people? He didn't ask them that in any way, shape, or form. He said, I have chosen you. We see in the Davidic covenant of 2 Samuel chapter 7, the prophet Nathan speaks the word of God to David, and he says this. He says, I will raise up your offspring after you. I will establish his kingdom. I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Again, we see the words of God saying, I will. He didn't ask David if David would like to be the progenitor of a race from whom he would choose Jesus. He didn't ask David for his permission. All the way up to the new covenant. I love the new covenant as expressed in Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah says the words of God, he says, I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God. They shall be my people. I will remember their sins no more. Again, we see the same words of God. He says, I will, I will, I will. And then we see in Ezekiel 36, he has, it says the exact same thing. He says, I will remove their heart of stone. I will replace it with a heart of flesh. Again, we see the prophetic words of God throughout the Old Testament saying, I will, I will, God will. And then we see in Ephesians chapter two that come to life when he says, but God, God did. God will, God did, and God does. Listen, we see what is our role, verses one through three. What is our role? We sin, God saves. We sin, God saves. That is our role. Now listen, I want to make a caveat. I had a discussion with a brother not too long ago. And it's not as if, it's not as if we're dragged kicking and screaming into the kingdom of heaven. It's not as if we have no responsibility. God tells us to repent and be saved. God tells us if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that you will be saved. So our responsibility is to respond. But what we've got to understand, the nature of salvation is that I would never respond to God of my own recognizance. I would never respond to God of my own. It's only after he brings me to life. So if you are ever asked the question, how were you saved? How were you saved? It could never be answered in the first person. If you ever are tempted to answer that question by saying, I, I did this, or I did that, I had faith, I believed, you're missing the point. The answer to that question always has to be in the third person. How were you saved? Because he, not because of anything that we did, but because of him, he is the active agent. And we see the primacy of God in these two simple words, but God. He is the one who chose. He is the one who redeemed. He is the one who sealed. Galatians chapter 4 verse 2 tells us that he is the one who even appointed the day that you would believe. He appointed the day for you. And so what do we do? We preach this gospel message with the explicit intention of the destruction of the pride of man. Because what is the great idol in the heart of every man? But the desire for autonomy, the desire to be the captain of your own faith, to call your own shots. And so these two simple words, but God, we see the primacy of God. But God, we see the ability of God. I pray that there's nobody here today in despair. But maybe somebody here has been in despair or maybe you're in despair now. Bleakness, when you look at your condition, and think to yourself that God could never love someone such as I. God could never save somebody with all the baggage that I have, all the things that I, you don't know what I've done. You don't know where I've been. You don't know the things that I've 
participated in. God tells us that nothing is impossible with him. What is the great error that we commit as people is the stratification of sin. We rank order of sins. And, we, and, and again, the intent there is that we would see where we fit in the stratification of sins. My sins are not as bad as this guy's, but they're better than this guy's over here. Uh, you know, we, we stratify sin. That is the great error that we commit as people. And I'm so thankful that the Lord thinks differently. Look at the people that God has chosen. Paul, a murderer of Christians. He chose a, a tax collector. One of the most horrific sinners in those days, a tax collector. He chose a doubter. Somebody just racked with doubt. He chose a harlot, prostitute. He chose a pagan king. He chose a deceiver. He chose a womanizer. He chose a coward. He chose a demon-possessed man, a leper and a eunuch. There's no end of the depths of love that God has to choose what the world would deem as lesser. And I'm so thankful for that. Today, he chooses the junkie. He chooses the homosexual, the criminal, the convict, the porn addict, the alcoholic. How do I know that? Because I've seen it happen in person. And I'm so thankful that God delights in choosing the most unlikely of people. Choosing the weak to shame the strong. Choosing the foolish to shame the wise. This is the ability of God. And we see this in these two simple words. But God. And then Paul proceeds to describe God. We see God described. You know, you may be looking at this and say, well, how could God possibly do these things? And that's the easy question because he tells us that in the previous chapter about the power of God through the power of the church. When he says that God is far above or Jesus is far above all rule and authority and power and dominion above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. The how is the easy way. A better question is the why. Why would God do such a thing as this? Why would God choose such a sinner as me. He tells us right there in verse 4, but God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, he's rich in mercy. We see God described as rich in mercy. I love to talk about the compassion of God. Uh, the elders and I were talking about compassion the other day, and God is frequently described as compassionate, which goes right along with mercy. Psalm 79, verse 8, the psalmist says, Do not remember against us our former iniquities. Let your compassion come speedily to us. Psalm 135, verse 14, The Lord will vindicate who? His people. And have compassion upon his servants. I love the words of Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 54, verses 7 and 8. It says, for a brief moment, I deserted you. These are the words of God. But with great compassion, I will gather you. God will gather his people. He is gathering his people in compassion. He says, with everlasting love, I will have compassion on you. I love the descriptions of Jesus several times throughout the Gospels. It says that he observes the crowd, the great crowds, and they are like sheep without a shepherd. What are sheep without a shepherd? They're hapless and helpless, completely at the mercy of the world and the enemies of the sheep, the wolves. But he has great compassion on them. Jesus is a God of great compassion, pity, sympathy, mercy. What does it mean to be merciful? Well, it's really simple. It means to have the power and authority over someone to punish them and then to decide not to, or in this case, to punish another on your behalf. And this is a description of God. He's rich in mercy. He's wealthy in mercy. At Wednesday night, we're talking all about God. This last week, we're, we're starting a series. We're going to talk about God. And we spent half the, half the night just writing things about God on the board. We filled up half the board. But here he tells us explicitly that he's rich in mercy. He's abounding in mercy. He's wealthy. He's overflowing. There is absolutely no deficit in his mercy. He's not lacking mercy in any way. 
I love the description of God in Exodus chapter 34 where Moses writes, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. And we read in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 10, that that mercy has been given to us, that once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And upon what basis? Paul tells us in Romans chapter 9 that he gives mercy to who he has, who he will give mercy. He gives compassion to who he will give compassion. Our God is so, so merciful. And it stands in stark contrast to the world today. I mean, we ought to marvel, marvel at the mercy of God. I mean, we live in a cold and compassionless world. I mean, there's certainly acts of mercy that occur out there. Maybe you've received an act of mercy. But in general, our world is a merciless world that will chew people up and spit them out. Maybe you've been chewed up and spit out before. I know I have. But we see here that God is described as rich in mercy. He's described as loving because of the great love with which he loved us. I love the description in 1 John chapter 4. John says this. He says, in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. He goes on to say, so we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love and whoever abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. I'd like you to consider the breadth of God's love for his people. We've talked about the covenant of redemption that an attorney passed, the triune God covenanted amongst, them, amongst himself to, to redeem a people for himself. God the Father covenanted to choose. God the Son covenanted to, to redeem. God the Holy Spirit covenanted to apply the work of salvation to the hearts of God's people. Consider the word foreknowledge. Some people hear the word foreknowledge and it's, it's in Scripture, and we're confused about what it means for God to have foreknowledge. Now, this word is used seven times in the New Testament, and there's a couple, two different ways this word is used. One way the word foreknowledge is used is just as prescience. That's a great word, meaning that God just knows things, and he knows things in advance. He just knows information in advance. But there's another way to think about foreknowledge that is prevalent in Scripture. And we know the biblical word, no, used in a biblical way. So, for example, God commands his son, Adam, to know his wife in the strictest biblical sense of the word and conceive children and bring them up in the way of the Lord. So there's an idea that to know someone is to have intimate relational knowledge with them. This is the predominant sense of foreknowledge. Consider what that means for you as a follower of Christ. When it says that God foreknew you in eternity past, before the foundation of the world, he knew you in an intimate way, knew every single thing about you. And scripture says those he, whom he foreknew he predestined, and as he foreknew you, every single thing about you, intimately, knows you better than you know yourself, better than your wife knows you, he decided that he would redeem you, that you would be his. And then he even appointed the date for you that he would reveal that to you. And then the scripture tells us that he formed you in your mother's womb, knit you together intimately, deliberately. Every single thing about you is no accident. God made you exactly the way he wanted you to be, brought you into this world, and preserved you. He's been with you all along, walking with you. I look back and I, I see the, the hundreds of times I should have died. God was right there walking with you, preserving you until that day that he appointed 
for you, that he would reveal to you his great love for you as he gave you a new heart, declared that you are now his. He'd always been his. And now he's going to walk with you in sanctification for the rest of your life, growing you into the image of Christ, conforming you, making you. Every single thing in your life, if you're a Christ follower, every single thing in your life is designed for one reason, to give you the opportunity to be more like him. And then one day he will glorify you. Stand before him and hear the sweetest words that there ever were. Well done, good and faithful servant. And you'll see God with unveiled eyes for the first time. Live in eternity serving him. What a beautiful picture of the breadth of God's love for his people from beginning to end, first to last. This is the breadth of his love, his great love with which he loved us. What an amazing thing that is, especially in contrast to who we are in verses 1 through 3. Consider the depths of the love of God that he has for you. Think of the person that you love most in your life. Husband, wife, mother, father, whoever that may be. Think of how much you love them. That love pales in comparison to the infinite love that God the Father has for God the Son. Yet Isaiah 53 verse 10 tells us that it pleased God, pleased God to crush his son on behalf of his people. This is the depth of the love of God for us. But God, then we see God described. He's rich in mercy. He's loving because of the great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. Here Paul again reminds us of who we are. It's a universal affliction for us. He says we, our, this is the universal spiritual death of humanity. You know, I get really tired of hearing about self-esteem. Can we just do away with self-esteem and modern notions of self-esteem? Is there anything more damaging to the gospel? than taking children from their earliest ages and telling them how wonderful they are their entire life, apart from Christ, just how, how wonderful and, and great that they are. Can we just do away with this notion of self-esteem for just a minute? Because I am confident, when, I, when it comes to myself, I am confident of exactly one thing, and that is my capacity to mess every single thing up if left to myself. It is the Christian who looks and sees his own wretchedness. It is the redeemed who understands and believes the depths of his own depravity. Who looks and understands his own capacity for sin. Listen, I look at myself and I know apart from the restraining hand of God, there is no limit to my own capacity for sin. It is the born again who acknowledges his own helplessness before a holy and a righteous God. This is why Jesus can describe believers in the Beatitudes as poor in spirit or those who mourn. Why would a believer be poor in spirit? Why would a believer be those who mourn? Because we look and we understand that God has given us everything. He's given us every single thing that there is. And yet we walk in rejection and rebellion of him. We took the image of God and slandered it and corrupted it. This is why a Christian is one who is poor in spirit and mourns because we understand that about ourselves. And then in sanctification, we come to an increasing understanding of that. Consider the words of Paul and how he describes himself. In 1 Corinthians 15, 9, Paul describes himself as the, as the least of the apostles. He looks at all the apostles, all, all 12 of them, and says, I am the least of them, 13 including himself. Then he looks at, a couple years later, and he writes Ephesians chapter 3, verse 8, that he's the least of all believers. I'm the least of the apostles. He's walking in fellowship with God. I'm the least of all the believers. A couple of years later, 1 Timothy chapter 1, he refers to himself as the chief of all sinners. Even the apostle Paul, as he grows in sanctification, comes to understand even more his own depravity. And he says, you were dead in your trespasses and sin. What do we do with that? Well, that's how you were. What do we do with it? There's generally speaking two ways that we handle our previous sin. We don't walk in it because God tells us we don't walk as we used to walk. 
And so there's one of two ways, there's kind of a spectrum when people look at how they used to be. One is I see people carrying around a lot of shame. Listen, sh shame is useful. Because quite frankly, people do things today that they ought to be ashamed of. And they seek to tell you that, well, we're not going to have shame anymore. I mean, that, that we see the world today casting off this idea of shame. I mean, there are things that we ought to be ashamed of. But shame has a purpose. It has a function. It drives us to repentance. It drives us to truly turn from whatever sin that is that's shameful. And then from that point on, I have no more need for shame. Romans 8, 1, my favorite verse in all of Scripture. There is therefore now... No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But yet we carry around shame from previous sin. We carry around shame from forgiven sin. And on the other end of the spectrum are those who cherish their sin. Remember the good old days when we used to do this and we used to do that. That we never cherish our spiritual deadness. What a temptation it is to, to reminisce about, about the things we used to participate in. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, God made us alive together in Christ. So we saw God described. Here we see God displayed. What did God do? He made us alive. Again, we see that he is the active agent here. Romans chapter 6, verse 11. So you must also consider yourselves dead to sin. And alive to God in Christ Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 22. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. This is the new birth. This is regeneration being brought from a position of being dead in Christ. Or being dead in our sin to being alive in Christ. Maybe you're saying, why do we spend so much time talking about this? I mean, this is... Uh, we're going to talk about this next week, too. We talked about it some last week. Now we talk about it all the time. And maybe you're saying, why do we? Yeah, we get it. We understand that it's God who's the active agent. And this is the reason we talk about this. So, one, it comes up all the time in Scripture. <laughs> That's the first reason. I mean, every, it comes up all the time in Scripture. But if we are not careful, intentional, and mindful, we will begin to readily allow ourselves to believe and to think that we have participated with God in our salvation. And we will unwittingly begin to rob God of some of his glory. And the issue is, because we have this idol in our hearts of human autonomy, where we want to call the shots, be the captains of our own destiny, what has ended up happening is that churches, pastors, and entire denominations are collaborating with the world and with your very flesh in an endeavor to rob God of even just a little bit of the glory of salvation. Even if just a little bit. You'll hear things said like, God makes salvation possible. But it's dependent upon you. That runs in stark contrast. That's the exact opposite of what God says right here in chat verse 4. Where he says, but God. He didn't say, but Chris. But Ben. But Sarah. God, dead or alive, I was one way, now I'm another. And between then and now is one thing, he, the Lord Jesus. What does it mean to be alive? It means that we're made new. We're a new creation. We have new affections, new hatreds of our sin. Listen, we, we still wrestle with sin, but I have a newfound hatred of my sin. It's an increasing holy hatred. I have a, a new awareness of my sin. Listen, I have the unfortunate uh, privilege of being an adult convert, so I remember very explicitly living in my sin, and it didn't bother me for a second. Not once was I troubled, like, wow, I'm doing all this bad stuff. No, that never happened at all. I, I, I was blind to it. 
didn't bother me in the least. We have a new hatred of our sin. And not only that, we have a new power to resist our sin. If you're a follower of Christ, you got the Holy Spirit himself indwelling you. We've been given a new mind, a new identity in Christ. We hear all this talk about identity and, and I'm this kind of Christian and that kind of Christian. And this, you know, our identity is follower of the one true king, son of son of God, daughter of the king. This is who we are in Christ. And there's no such thing. Scripture knows nothing of a man who has been resurrected to life, who still walks as a dead man. Listen, I can't tell, I've said this before, the hardest people to witness to in all of all the world are American Christians. You know, we go down to the, the apartment complex. We were just down there last week and had a, a, some wonderful encounters. We were in the trailer park too. And you come to people and it's like, uh, we're here to tell you about the Lord Jesus. It's like, well, I'm already a Christian. Uh, we were there last month and I, I swear this guy had just gotten done smoking some really good weed like I mean I, I swear he had just set it down and then he's like well I, I've already been saved I believe the gospel message so well where do you go to church sir I don't go to church I don't have anything to do with the body of Christ I don't have anything to do with the Lord but I, I've been saved one man told me he was saved in 1973 the year that I was born date myself there. He hasn't been to church since, has nothing to do with the Lord, but this man is firmly convinced in his mind that he is redeemed. I said to this man, you're lying to yourself, sir. And it breaks my heart when I go to Walmart or wherever I go, and it ought to break your heart too as you walk around. And not only do you see spiritually dead people walking around, statistically speaking, most of the people you interact with are not redeemed. But the real scary thing is you're interacting with spiritually dead people, spiritual corpses walking around who think, who are convinced in their heart of hearts that they're alive. That's tragic to us. We ought to see in our redemption, in being made alive, a difference. Dead people don't look anything like living people. Living people look completely like, unlike dead people. There should be a difference. God has made us alive. We see God displayed as he's raised us up with him. He's in our union with Christ. He's resurrected us with Christ. The redeemed has, or the redeemed has been redeemed just as the redeemer has been resurrected. Verse six, he seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. This is where we see the condition of already, but not yet that the kingdom has been inaugurated. Jesus is presently ruling on the throne. Colossians 1.13 says that he has transferred you believers from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of his son. He's the one who did that. Where you are presently ruling with him, but one day he's going to come again and consummate his kingdom and that rule will become tangible and visible for everyone. But listen, this is a promise so sure, a promise so secure that it's spoken of as if it already happened. I mean, Romans 8, chapter 30, the, ver the golden chain of salvation, those he foreknew, those he predestined, those he called, those he justified, those he glorified, spoken of as if it already happened. We see God described in verse 4. We see God displayed in verse 5 and 6. Verse 7, we see God de demonstrated demonstrated forever for all time so that in the coming ages he might do what? He might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Listen, just as the resurrection was the seal of validation upon the work of Christ upon the cross, it was the verification and apart from the resurrection of Christ, our faith is in vain is what scripture tells us. Your resurrection, your new birth, your new life, is a demonstration of the power of God, of the grace of God, of his kindness, of his kindness. Listen, as we prepare to close here, I'd like to ask you a couple of questions. Paul tells us to examine ourselves whether to see whether we are in the faith. And one of the greatest errors we could commit would be to reassure spiritually dead people that they are, in fact, alive. I mean, God forbid that we ever make that assumption. 
They've been attending church for their whole life. Listen, my father was a lifelong church attender. He helped build the sanctuary. He sang in the choir. It came to my knowledge prior to his death last year. I knew it all along, but that he was not, in fact, redeemed. And praise God, I had the chance to share with him multiple times before he passed. And I believe that he was redeemed. But God, forgive us if we make that assumption. And so I'm asking you to examine yourself. Are you spiritually alive? Would somebody look at your life and see a demonstration of the power of God, of the kindness and grace of God, when somebody looks at your life? If so, praise God in glory. Hallelujah. If not, then at the very least, there's a problem in your walk somewhere. But are you of the faith? Let us never presume that. Are you alive? When you look at yourself in the way you once were, that you were dead in your trespasses and sin, what do you do with those trespasses and sin? Are you still carrying around shame? Are you still participating in them? Do you still cherish previous trespasses and sin? Are you alive? Lastly, maybe you're being honest with yourself and you know that you are not of the Lord. You've never been redeemed. Well, guess what? Today could be that day that was appointed for you. Would you repent of your sins and be saved today and be brought to life? What an amazing thing that would be. I mean, I don't know why you came here this morning. God brought you here this morning. And what an amazing thing if years from now you look back and saw April, whatever this day is, second, third, third, April the third. That was the day that I was brought to life. But God, let's pray. Jesus, we love you and we praise you, God. I, th I thank you for your word that reminds us so clearly that salvation belongs to you, O oh Lord. I pray that even now your Holy Spirit is working in the hearts of your people, calling us to repentance. God, that you would grant us repentance. God, that we would not be content to walk as spiritually dead people. Those of us who are alive, God, that we would no longer walk as the Gentiles walk. God, continue to call us out of the pervading darkness of our lives. God, continue to reveal to us our sin. Continue to teach us. God, continue to grow a holy hatred, to cultivate a hatred of our sin in our hearts. God, I pray that you would grant us clean hands and a pure heart to walk in holiness and righteousness. God, maybe there's somebody here today that's wrestling with a decision that they need to make. God, maybe there's somebody here that needs to take a step of faith. God, I pray that you would grant them courage to step in faith, to walk by faith and not by sight. And lastly, God, I'd like to pray for anyone who's unredeemed here. Lord, I pray that you have brought them here for the explicit reason to hear the gospel message. God, I pray that in eternity past, you foreknew them, predestined them, and now you're calling them. God, I pray that even now you're granting them a new heart and that they would see the wretchedness of their lives, that they're dead and their trespasses and sins in which they are once walking, which they are walking. That they would bow their heads and say, Lord, save me, a sinner. Lord, your word tells us that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. God, I pray that this would be the day of salvation. And lastly, Lord, I pray that you would open up all of our hearts to see those around us every single day who are stumbling to the slaughter. Proverbs 24 tells us. Lord, I pray that you would open our hearts to see our co-workers, our family members, our neighbors, our friends even, our loved ones that are unredeemed. And as you open our hearts, God, that you would set our hearts to open up our mouths to go to them with the words of life 
to proclaim truth, that you would use us in a mighty way in another's life. And it's in your holy name that we pray. Amen. Would you stand with us as we sing? Thank <laughs> you.